What's good, people? Welcome back to the Onyx Report. Black Masculine News for the day. I hope everybody's well. Shout out to all of you. I hope you guys had a good holiday week, whatever that means to you. Uh, I know I did. I got to kick it with my son. This is the first time I got to hang with him uh, since August, since he left. So I had a real good time doing that. Watched a bunch of stuff, talked, played chess, you know. Just kind of kicked it. So shout out to my son. I uh, hope he's well now that he's back in the dorms. But uh, yeah, man, it's all good. Shout out to uh, Alex the Wolf. Um, he says, bought your book early. We'll give it his holiday gifts. Much appreciated. Thank you. Shout out to Chef Mike. What's good? Definitely shout out to uh, Urban Naturalist. Hope you're well. Um, happy birthday. Blessed solar return to you. Says I'm kicking it. You know, listening in. Appreciate that. What's good, Toya? Hope you're well. Uh, what's up, Christopher? Indigo? What's good with you, Mark? Good to see you in here. Spain man, what's up? Longo? Got Detroit, Prince. What's happening? Malika, what's good, man? You know, Kane, uh, Andre, number of people in here. Um, it's Indigo. <laughs> Artisan, what's up with you, man? What's good? Hope you're well. LXST. I don't know. I don't know if that's how I'm supposed to say it, but hope you're well. You know, um, yeah. So we got a few people in already. Um, shout out to Indigo. Says he bought the book. You know, so let me get the preliminaries kind of out the way. If you haven't already, make sure you support the show. Donate, like, share, subscribe, join uh, to support the show so we can continue to bring this, bring you this independent black male thought. About a number of different varieties of topics. This is actually a, a requested one. So we're going to go there. So please make sure that uh, you make it a point to support the show so that we can continue. Uh, and as well, make sure you pick up the book, Solutions for Anti Black Misandry, Flat Blackness, and Black Male Death, The Black Masculine's Turn. Uh, go ahead and check that book out. Support it if you will. Uh, this is what some of the brothers are saying they already purchased. So shout out to y'all for doing so. Okay, LXST, that's the way to say it. Beautiful. What's up, Dante? Got Forever Blessed in here. Cutting up with the Joneses. Okay, what's going on? Yeah. So, you know, now that we've kind of gotten through some of the preliminary stuff, 
Uh, let me invite my guest up with me as we chop this one up. Uh, shout out to BGS. What's good, man? Hey, what's good, Doc? Uh, appreciate Lord, it. Lord Hassan, the villain of uh, you Gotham go. City. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah, man. <laughs> oh, man. So old that cat. I'm a hero. <laughs> I'm a vigilante. Mm hmm. But uh, nah, man, I appreciate you jumping in, you know, for folks, you know, coming into this, uh, I'd say about Saturday, I had, uh, by Saturday, I had about four or five brothers reach out to me and ask me to review the uh, short documentary on Netflix. And so in doing so, um, I mentioned it to BGS in conversation. And these things are just, you know, they're, they're a lot more fun to get through as a conversation and just a straight up, you know, review, um, you know, uh, it, it's a lot easier to do a review when you can act, especially of a documentary, when you can comment as you're showing it. Yeah. Um, but since we're going to do this, you know, live on YouTube, uh, it's just better to kind of have a conversation. But I was, you know, it's been requested by a number of people, as I said, to kind of review this one. So, um, you know, I thought it'd be best to do that. And BGS is coming out hot off a of video on emotional labor that you guys need to check out. Do you want to uh, share the channel and the title of that one? So people oh, can get sure. To yeah, the, uh, uh, I, I did a reaction to uh, uh, the Pimp God's uh, view on the emotional labor. In other words, it's called the, the Holes uh, uh, Debt okay? Okay. tab. In other words, basically, uh, he's just saying uh, why. You know, <laughs> he just said, he said, he said, pimps get paid for emotional labor and tricks uh, have to pay for it. They, okay. they give it away for free. It, well, all you're saying is it, know your worth and, and and get something out of every every interaction. You know, but this is but, or, but, but today's no yeah. But, but but today's episode is part of a series, though, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. we we we're trying to get you know the doc knows we're trying to get uh, men and academia to actually recognize male emotional labor and male emotional intelligence. Okay, because it's 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 vacant, right? It's 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 uh, uh it's a uh, absent from the from the discussion so mm -hmm. when you go to a uh, a therapist or you go to school or or, or you or try to get a law passed okay they don't actually include the emotional labor women have been taught about emotional labor that they do for for 40 years right mm -hmm. and men they say men don't have it don't have any emotional intelligence they, they do all the emotional labor okay? right we're trying to equalize that that that, that balance so men at least have a shot, have a part of the of the discussion because men do a lot of emotional labor. We mm -hmm. do, we do. It just doesn't look like what how women do it. That's what we actually want to recognize. What does a male emotional labor and, and emotional intelligence actually look like? It does not look the same as what women do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I just finished a, a piece for Oxford um, for one of their journals on emotional labor. So that's gonna that's going through you know the peer review process, but. Yeah. Um, I just finished the contribution to that a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, getting the conversation about men and particularly black men's, uh, you know, because I do argue that black men have a distinct type of performance as it relates to emotional labor that needs to be discussed. So, mm -hmm. we, you know, we're getting that out there and we're moving from there. Shout out to, to KP Bailey. What's up with you? Um, hope you're good. Shout out to your husband. Um, let's see. Yeah. So, yeah. So check out the series if you haven't already. Which channel is it on? It's on my BGS uh, Itmore channel. Okay. Well, yeah, check that series out. I think it's been like a month, right? It's been a month. We've actually done over the series of like maybe six months. We've done emotional uh, labor. We talked about the male emotional labor as far as I think it was Officer and the Gentleman and uh, I think it was Maverick who actually reviewed what it looks like for a male to do. But things lately we talked about um, um more directly towards male and female, okay, mm -hmm. in, in dynamic. The most labor that we actually do for women, mm -hmm. especially black men, you know. Yeah, which but, which we're we're taught has no value. It's just yes. something we're supposed to do. And when you're talking about a generation from Generation X and younger, yes. Generation X being the first one to really be raised by single mothers on an unprecedented scale, as far as historically, you know, right. That's significant because women taught us to serve women. You know, yes. and that that was normalized, particularly in the black community. That's why I talk about it 
as a, you know, but black male performances of emotional labor are different because we came out of a different historical narrative, one where, you know, servicing women was how we were raised. That's right. what we were taught was supposed to be normal. Uh, and I think it's reached a point where, you know, we don't even know how to talk about it, but we're measured. Our value as men yeah. is measured on how well we perform something that we were not necessarily taught how to do. We were just taught to do it. Yes. And you just had to figure it out. And you're, you know, women would, would drop you if you didn't do it, even though nobody tells you that this mm -hmm. is, you know, verbally says out loud, this is what's expected of you. So, yeah. yeah. They, they, they dropped that real man on you. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Real quick. And I think in my next show, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the media performances I've seen that really conform to that because I messed around and, and turned my TV on. I think it was like Friday morning and it was on it was on BET her or one of those kind of channels and mm -hmm. i just sat there and watched it for a while so i was like yeah i gotta talk about this so i'll, I'll share some <laughs> comments from that bullshit but, <laughs> what they're doing right now is just it's oh my god it's, it's on steroids yeah oh yeah it's a it's a cancer that has metastasized for real so <laughs> stage four feminism. oh my god man <laughs> you want to see the gynocracy gynocracy on display watch bet her <laughs> Damn near movie after movie after movie is the gynocracy on display. I mean, dysfunctional is. And when they show you what they expect them, I mean, it actually happened again today. I was, I was flipping around and, and, you know, saw another one of these black movies with, you know, black women leading. And them leading is not the problem. But the way the stories are written, they're almost always accompanied by a male, black male cuck, you mm -hmm. know, who's, who's, who's pretty much, you know, Anyway, I'll get Thir it. Thoroughly emasculated and castrated. Completely. I mean, this particular movie I was watching today by accident, you know, she's hitting him and punching him and he's dead. And then she she fell to the floor and started crying after she hit him and punched <laughs> him a few times and he ran over and apologized. And, and I watched I watched enough to know he didn't do anything to apologize for. He just started hitting him. And, you know, and I'm just like, see, this kind of shit right here, this is the kind of social training we get in media. Yeah, about how we're supposed to bend the knee and so on and so forth, and you can't hold women accountable. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the bottom line to it. Seeing seeing love songs where she hurls heavy things at you. Man. Oh my! God. <laughs> that I'm telling you, man, we got decades of that dysfunction, mm -hmm. and, and you know it, it's getting to a point where you know you got whole generations of young men that are that are split into two groups at least either the group that that doesn't know that this is something they're not supposed to deal with or the group that's checked out entirely yes and yeah. it's, it's really getting to that point uh yeah. sh shout out to compassionate and callous what's good with you man kg Etern kj eternal what's up money mike you know but yeah hey, yeah watch out uh callous if you don't watch out the lord Hassan will come visit you okay from Here Gotham you City. Go. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Got me out here looking like a villain. Boy. <laughs> if you live long enough. <laughs> I guess so. But so today we're going to deal with one of the developments of um, this gentleman here. This is Ibram X. Kendi. He is, um, I guess, you know, what might, one might refer to as the current white liberal darling. Mm -hmm. uh, the black community. He's got a degree out of Temple University, and he is uh, the anti-racist go-to academic. You know, um, and so he's been he's been pretty hot in the news lately. Um, you know, for a number of things. I think this is. Uh, let me go ahead and see if I, I can go ahead and share this piece here. So this is out the Washington Post. Let me realign it. Uh oh, I lost it. Uh, let me go ahead and put it back up. There it is. All right. So this is on the Washington Post, as you can see, and it is this is dated September 28th. Uh so Ibram Max Kendi is the author of the book Stamped from the Beginning, which is, you know, has been made into a short documentary. I want to say what, an hour and a half, something like that? Yeah. You know, pretty short documentary. Uh, dealing with the history of racist ideas. And he calls this book the definitive history of racist ideas. And so we're going to get into that film. But before we do so, I just wanted to briefly kind of mention what's been going on with him lately. So apparently, um, I'm not going to read through this whole article, but you can find it on the Washington Post. It's entitled Ibram X. Kendi's Fall is a Cautionary Tale. So was his rise. White American elites are always ready to turn a black intellectual 
into a mouthpiece for their political agenda. And this is the Washington Post. So that's interesting. Um, but, you know, as I'll just share this paragraph here just to give you some framework for what's going on with them now. It reads, it's a cautionary tale that has been on my mind lately as I've watched the implosion of the black historian Ibram X. Kendi. Perhaps the leading figure of the contemporary anti-racism movement, Kendi has faced new scrutiny after he recently laid off more than half of his staff at his Center for Anti-Racist anti Research in Boston, at, you know, Boston University, uh, where the center is housed, has now opened an inquiry into how it was run. Allegations include poor pay, employee exploit exploitation, the failure to produce any significant research, and the mismanagement of $43 million in donations. Oh, wow. $43 million. So this is what's, what's, what's under scrutiny at this moment. So any thoughts about any of that? Shades of BLM, huh? It, it seems so. And, and, uh, you know, he's, you know, suggested some, if nothing else, ideological ties to BLM. Mm. Uh, assuredly as a feminist, you know, his idea, his ties are quite evident. So shout out to BGS for the support. Shout out to, uh, Miss KP for that support. Again, uh, donate, support the show, if you will. So, yeah, you know, he, he's he's acknowledged some, you know, generic ties. And you can definitely see that in a film mm -hmm. because the film is overwhelmingly done. Not only, I think it's it, it wouldn't do it justice to say that it's from a black feminist lens. It's it is a completely gynocratic project. It is. It is. So, you should have just taught a history of black women, black history of black women for the most part. Yeah, and we're going to get into why I think they framed it that way. But let's let's kind of start uh, from the beginning. So um, let me see. So you got Abram there. And hold on, maybe I'll take this off real quick, and we'll just kind of start from here. So again, you know, something that brothers wanted me to cover. So this, it came out November twentieth on Netflix, stamped from the beginning, and you can kind of see it there. Um, and the way they kind of did this, um, let me see. Oh, all right. Didn't mean to do that, but the hell. All right. It, it, this is, this kind of gives you a sense of who was in. So in this, this particular, um, documentary, they try to cover the history, as they say, of racist ideas in America. And, and they primarily used other than Kendi himself mostly black women, almost all, I think entirely black women yeah. to narrate and to give commentary in studio commentary, you know, centered by Angela Davis. So you can see at the top center uh, and a number of other younger scholars, uh, you know, scholar activists, if you will. Um, this is the kind of commentary that they give or gave um, alongside. Let's see. You know, because we always have to kind of go to IMDB, kind of look at who's doing what over here. So if you can see that, this is IMDB, stamp from the beginning, hour and 31 minutes, right? And I just kind of wanted to show you guys. So this is directed by Roger Ross Williams. Um, and you can kind of see, I don't know if you how clearly you can see some of the images of the cast. Now they showed two guys in it, but I don't remember them giving commentary. So either they did and I forgot, or they may have been some of the actors because that they played certain scenes where you had people dressed as historical characters right. acting out certain scenes. Yeah. You know, but outside of Kendi, you know, Kendi's the only male voice. All the rest are coming from not only black women scholars, but I would argue mostly black feminist scholars for the most part. So you can see some of them there, um, you know, many of whom I wasn't familiar with, except for obviously Angela Davis. Of course, I'm, I'm aware of Brittany Cooper. Uh, Imani Perry was in it, but, you know, I just kind of wanted you to see some of the faces involved in the project and some of the faces that were not involved in the project, if you will. So that's kind of, you know, something to look for or to look at, I guess I can say. So that's your that's your primary speaking base there. Um So it, 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 as far as the optics, the first thoughts you had watching this and looking at who uh, was was allowed to give voice to black history and who was excluded from it. What were some thoughts that you had about that? I at first, you know, um, 
I first I thought when I first started looking at it, the people that were actually speaking, I thought it's going to be a, a very female centered uh, black history, which, you know, which in a sense it was kind of. But the thing is, um, I, you know, I started to get confused because uh, um, even though they were they were taught about black women, actually, the thing is, how, how do you say it? When it's when it's them, it's it's a uh, it's her. When it's a uh, when it's men, it's, it's it's us. Okay, flat blackness. Oh, for that. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. So, what I'm I guess we can jump into that. So, yeah. for the most part, you know, standing back, let me first start with the positive, or mm -hmm. I guess the one positive I'll give the film as a as a media, you know, analyst in terms of a lot of the stuff I teach in my classes. He had a lot of good imagery. Mm -hmm. A lot of the good images, pictures, historical pictures, uh, video, even some of the commercials and film clips that were, were used to make certain points about the impact of, you know, ideas on the culture, on, on mainstream culture. He got some good imagery, you know, for the, for all of that. Uh, a lot of that stuff I would use. Um, so I, I will at least extend that. Uh, you know, but the major focus, I, the major problem with this, I, as I saw it, is, is, is its gynofocal. Kind of framework. Yeah. yeah, it was it, because most of all the stuff he said was accurate for the most part, right? Right. I couldn't find anything that was inaccurate. The thing is, is what angle did he look from? Right, and he primarily chose, other than himself, a black feminist framework. Yeah. I don't mean fem. Well, he's a feminist, so it's not other than himself in that context. But in terms of you know gender, he's yeah. the only he, he's the only male. Everybody else was what they well, I guess they for <laughs> female presenting. You got to say yeah. shit like that. But anyway. So you mostly had women. And, and so when they gave the narrative of African-American history, there were certain points that you can't avoid talking about blackness as a communal framework. And then, of course, in terms of gender representation, they primarily only dealt with black women. But when it was communal in focus, they mm -hmm. rarely I think I, I only heard them use the term black males or black men once or twice. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, they would. And this is what I talk about when I talk about uh, black blackness. They talked about black people when it had anything to do with men mm -hmm. and when it had to do with women, they specifically focused on black women. You know, matter of fact, there were there were several black women that were highlighted throughout yeah. the course of the film as the subject of analysis. You know, Phyllis Wheatley, Harriet Jacobs, Ida B. Wells. And they didn't they, they didn't you know, they didn't use Ida B. Wells Barnett It's just Ida B. Wells. And they you know, they gave ample time to each one of those three women you know, talking about the history of the black community and, and its response to white supremacy, so on and so forth. Uh, I think they gave a couple of minutes to the Civil War. You know, so yeah, you saw yeah, black yeah. men dying on the screen. Dying down the screen and, and signing up as, as, as soldiers, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, and it's a real, it, see this, and I realized why the brothers were calling me, mm -hmm. because it was real subtle. Yeah, it was. It was real subtle. And, and they were trying to, you know, and one of the guys I had an extensive conversation with before I actually watched the film and he said, Doc, the film is okay. The information is okay. But he yeah. said, there's something about, I can't put my finger on what's going on with it. And that's why he asked me to watch it. He said, well, you know, because I don't know how to describe it. I don't know how to say it. There's nothing I'm pointing to that was outright wrong. But eh, you got to watch. It. And that's, that's what I heard from all the brothers that reached out. You got to watch it and you'll see what we mean. And I was like, okay, I see what they're talking about. Yeah, and in other words, you know what? What I noticed was um, uh, the first thing that they they mentioned. I think well, you know, when the beginning of the film is that um, is that black women had it uh, as bad or worse than black men, and and their experience during slavery was worse than black men because of the added thing of of uh, of, of of rape and and them having to be. Uh, chased by massa and stuff like that so they they did that rather early and i think the whole film was the comparison of uh of or trying to center black women as having it uh being the major victims and heroes of of, of the struggle yeah they did and they were i think they were quoting harriet jacobs at that point right as she was trying to appeal to what she identified as women of the North on behalf of 2 million Southern women mm -hmm. by saying that slavery was, was much worse for women than it was for men. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so I was like, okay, that's that's interesting in and of itself. That's what you're going to focus on. And they really doubled down on Phyllis Wheatley, Harriet Jacobs, and really tried to frame the response to, you know, white supremacist media and ideas, you know, in their their artistic works. And yeah. by doing so, they, they really sidestepped a lot of men as if those men didn't exist at all. You know, these three women, you know, kind of just it stood up out of nowhere and they defied it. And then there's the rest of those black people that we know did stuff. But, you know, they really. So what you have with this film is it's a political piece. Mm-hmm. It's a political piece that's trying to shift the focus in terms of who the activists are, who the agents of change are, who's right. contributed the most, who's done the most just uh, kind of work. And as opposed to saying black men ain't shit, they just don't acknowledge them. Well, they're, they're just uh, helpless victims of, of white supremacy. That's the way they're framed. But but not given face or name. Not given face or name. Yeah. And so that's kind of one of the things that you see. And, and so in class, when I start this discussion, I think it's important to kind of note um, something that I want to kind of play out here. Now, this is from a, a familiar uh, a friend of the show. And this is a video he did some years ago. But let me go ahead and pull it up and I might have to cue it. So bear with me because I, I didn't cue it beforehand as I should have. But here we go. I'm not familiar. You know that guy? Mm, I recognize that symbol. Okay. Oh, okay. That, that, that thumbnail is very familiar. I, I yeah. Okay. I've seen him around. He's a troublemaker right here. Uh, he's, he's always up to something. I might have to cue it. Let me get. Uh, oh, yeah. We got it. So this is this is a piece that you shared years ago mm-hmm. from Dr. Claude Anderson. Mm-hmm. And I show this in my class to this day because it's something that after three degrees in Africana studies, I've never heard anyone say outright, right? So let me go ahead and share it. Here we go. <laughs> let me take about three or four minutes to just laugh to myself because you just asked a critically important question. And and the, and your theme for today, fork in the road. You know what the great irony there is, road is that that's exactly, exactly, and I can spell the word exactly, a x a c t l e y, exactly <laughs> for you. That's exactly where black folks were back over two hundred some years ago, because you see the fork in the road, <laughs> that was the biggest darn death hole for black slaves in the country off of the eastern shore. See, when, when Virginia, South Carolina, and North Carolina went into the slave-producing industry after the Constitution outlawed slave importing after 1808 into this country, they had to have, have another way to create babies against slaves. So they started bringing in black women into the country then in mass numbers. See, most of the blacks in the feminist movement don't even understand that. They think that slavery was about black women. It was not about black women. Slavery was about man to man, men to men. It was about blacks against white men and black men and white men against black men. That's what slavery is about. Eighty percent of all the slaves coming to the country were basically black men. Until the Constitution in 1789 says you got 25 years to cut out and no more bringing in slaves. And it's and the, and the three states that push to get that 25-year postponement from 1789 up to 1808 with South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. Mm-hmm. It's to give us a chance to, to, to get situated because we need these black slaves. And why they need black slaves? Because they said, because the wealth, the wealth of these stations, of these states, and the wealth of these colonies, and the wealth of this nation is in black slaves. That is the primary generator of wealth. Black slaves are a, force, a, a form of currency. It's like money. That's where that that that's who generates the wealth in the country. A black slave had, was like a walking express card, a visa card. A white man who owned a slave did not have to work. He could earn money just by renting that slave out and going earning it. And so South Carolina, North Carolina, and um, Virginia, they started once they started raising, they brought they started bringing in black women in here so they can impregnate them and started getting babies free. What they were paying about. $25 or $27 a piece getting them off the coast of Africa then trying to sell them for eight, nine hundred dollars at about a 1500% profit margin in the United States. They didn't have to do that any longer. They started using black women and impregnating them and raising free black slaves. But once they raised those slaves, 
they then had to take them across the country. And the biggest depot for receiving them was called a fork in the road. And that was in New Orleans. New Orleans was a fork in the road. They, they make those blacks walk from Virginia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, all the way barefooted, in chain, all the way to the fork in the road in the New Orleans area. And it's sort of ironic that with the whole enslavement process and the marches across America to the fork in the road, that the fork in the road has not changed. Why well, not older? Black folk are still marching still going someplace, still in chains mentally, and still winding up producing wealth and income and enriching other people. Black folk have enriched every religion, every ethnic group, every culture. They've enriched in every nation. They've enriched everybody on the earth but themselves. They are the primary uh, engineers of wealth. The wealth of this nation was built on the backs of black slaves and, and Indian land. And that, that, that is the primary generator of wealth in America. And our people have never, 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 never fully understood that. They've been misled and bamboozled and believing that somehow that wealth in this nation is who you get along with. Okay. I didn't stop it. It's, it, it's That's a short video. Yeah. But uh, you put that up years ago. Talk a little bit about that piece for us. Oh, yeah. He's saying that... Uh that and it's something I noticed uh, that I discovered, right? 91% of Ado's uh, people were actually uh, uh, born, were actually created uh, inside the United States after uh, 1808. Mm -hmm. So basically you were sired, you were actually raised like like animals after that. And uh, what he was saying is that uh, because, it, because I think it was after the, uh, after the, especially after the Louisiana uh, Purchase, right? Uh, they had all this land, raw land that they needed to uh, conquer, you know, drive the Indians off and actually uh, make it uh, valuable. So they needed actually more slaves. And even uh, back then, uh, at the time of the Civil War, I think 70 um, percent of the uh, nation's GDP came from the South and came from black slaves. So what he's talking about, that uh, that uh, they were the most um, valuable uh, item in the United States then was very true. Uh, in fact, the first subprime uh, mortgage crisis was actually uh, uh, people that couldn't pay for their slaves. So they actually uh, took slaves up and walked them from like Louisiana or, or, or Mississippi to Texas where, they, where it didn't apply. Mm -hmm. So it was actually the first subprime mortgage crisis was actually, uh, and I think it was 1840, I think 45, 46, um, mm -hmm. that right. uh, they were trying to repossess uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to repossess slaves <laughs> right well this is but the reason i'm playing it is the mm -hmm. portion of what he was saying that i thought was relevant to this mm -hmm. is you know something that i had not heard after a couple of decades mm -hmm. you know at least not formally not in a class not in a discussion not even in a reading assignment in terms of gender the yeah. only time you know coming through from black studies to africana studies and whatnot the only time we talked about gender was as it related to sexual violation in black women. Mm -hmm. That was formally what, what constituted gender in the context of slavery, as far as discussion was concerned. There was never a discussion of, of you know, who was represented, who was taken. Was there a gender dimension to which people were enslaved and which ones were late? And, and so now what I teach my students is if you want to deal with that in terms of gender, you can look at, say, the contrast. Mm -hmm. between um you know the arab slave trade and you know the transatlantic european slave trade and one of the things we noticed although i very rarely heard people say this out loud the arab slave trade fixated on taking women right they fixated on taking women yeah. that's where you can really have a critical discussion about you know the numbers because they focused on that they castrated many a man yeah but they focused on taking a lot of women in, in that regard putting them to work but also putting them into harems and so on and so forth European slave trade was very different, right? It was market-based. It was based on raw labor. Mm -hmm. And they took mostly black men and worked them to death and replaced them. Right. Like, so what, like, what, like machinery. Yeah. Like and machinery. black women, the black women couldn't do that kind of heavy, hard work. Even uh, uh, uh cotton was was not as heavy as sugar cane right. and, and and rice and the other kind of uh yeah. uh base basic uh, items, right? Women couldn't do that kind of work because it was it was messy, it was dangerous, mm -hmm. and it was uh it was full of disease. And uh, black men uh, has have short lifespans, 
So imagine a woman trying to go into that kind of uh, environment. It wouldn't live long. But it wasn't to say they, they took no women, women. It's just no. to say they took an overwhelming degree yeah. of men early on. So he identified 1789 to about 1808 yes. in this time period yeah. where they're allowed to actually bring over more women so that they can begin to mass produce an indigenous yes. North American enslaved population. Yeah, because that mean, cause Virgin, Virginia's land was uh, had been kind of uh, toasted by uh, by tobacco raising, and mm. and the only thing they had valuable was uh, in Virginia was uh, slaves, mm -hmm. uh, breeding slaves. That's why Thomas Jefferson did it. It was one of the reasons. Well, but, yeah, two. The other reason is is the uh, is the uh, slave revolts. Mm -hmm. You know, from from Af from freed formerly freed Africans. Okay. To be mm -hmm. enslaved, it's better actually raise them from scratch. Uh, hold on. Go ahead. Uh, I lost my train of thought. I was about, about to say something. Um, I think it's uh, where to it go. Damn it! I'd have to open up one of my things to find it. There's a particular author that I think is important to bring up at this juncture for anyone that wants to delve into that. Oh, the the, the the the. Uh, the American Slave Coast it was a book that actually, it's like 700 pages actually deals in this from from, from start to finish. How uh, how Jefferson actually planned it, plotted it, and actually negotiated that, that settlement uh, between not a Great Britain, but also America. And then when he got into office in 1808, he actually, wanted, actually implemented that law that uh, actually ended the external slave trade and, and actually enhanced the internal slave trade. Hold on. No, my, no, my, I'm thinking of something else. It just, you know, it's one of those things that I'm not going to get out of my head until I can. <laughs> there it is. All right. So, um, by the way, this is, I think the, I think he passed away. His name is Dr. Joseph Holloway, author of the book, Africanisms and American Culture. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he talked about, uh, back in the early nineties was why Africans were chosen. And he went into great detail to highlight how specific Mm -hmm. Slave owners would call out very distinct groups of West Africans that had been enslaved and brought over based on what they knew how to do already. Yeah, yeah. Like cotton, of crops. Yeah, cotton, cotton, rice, and, yeah. Sugar. Yeah, a lot of different cocaine. sugar. Absolutely. Yeah. So he identified, and so he kind of talks about it from that angle. But the, the critical part of the period from 1789 to 1808, where they're, they're, they're really refocusing and trying to get as many Black women as possible, is something that we don't talk enough about because that means that you really don't have a critical mass of, of black women here until at least the first part, you know, of the 19th century, right? right. The early part of the 19th century. So right. we're talking, if you say 1808, 1810, around there, mm -hmm. that's, that's 50 odd, 55 odd years mm -hmm. away from the civil war. Right. So when you talk about the beginnings of chattel slavery, 16, you know, 19, what, what from to eight, we're talking about a mostly black male focused endeavor. Right. And so this film is trying to not only give you an overview of the origin of racist ideas, they're also trying to give you a quick overview, quick and dirty overview of black history, but, you know, primarily with female actors and agents as the only relevant people of note. And in doing so, completely gloss over the early part, the first two centuries of it being primarily focused on black males. Mm -hmm. They won't acknowledge it. They won't say it. And you'd be hard pressed to find others other than Dr. Claude Anderson, who's willing to say that out loud. That's right? true. But yeah. about 50 years before the Civil War, you bring in this mass. And then, of course, you know, so what this film does is is they kind of do a couple of things. One, it's it's kind of a revisioning of black history from a, a female standpoint without acknowledging that that's what you're going to do, because it's not like the film is called the black feminist reimagining of black history. It's called Stamp from the Beginning. And, it, and the book subtitle is The Definitive History of Racist Ideas. Right. There's no mention whatsoever about the removal of men. There's no mention whatsoever about a gynofocal or black feminist focus. None of it. So it's presented as this kind of, you know, objective mm -hmm. analysis of black history. But, you know, the, the contributions and presence of black men are greatly played down, despite that the largest population of black women don't come in until about 50 years before the Civil War where chattel slavery formally it ends. There's no discussion about that whatsoever, right? That's the first part. And then the second part, and I don't know if you if you noticed this or what your thoughts are on it, but I, I called it a kind of bi-chronological comparative. What they had 
was they kept taking us to the past and then they would show images of say BLM marching right. in the streets in the last yeah. decade. Yeah. And, and so you had this kind of underlying tone that it's black women that carry the, 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 the you know, kind of anti injustice push and that black men were really weren't, you know, weren't significant in any of that. It's just really, it's black women who were carrying it then black women who are still carrying it now and black women who are giving commentary right. on the history and the ideas themselves uh, other than Kendi. Any, any mm -hmm. thoughts about that? Yeah, basically, you know, which is brilliant, you know, if you look at it, right, he's showing the connection from from antecedents in slavery, you know, hundreds of years ago to what's going on right now and how those two things actually match up and how, how they equate, how they, you know, you know, in other words, the, the action and the reaction. In other words, mm -hmm. that, that that standard or that history or that 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 lineage has carried forward even till, you know, the 21st century, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. The way they framed it, you know. It was... Shout out to uh, Pocket Watching with JT. Y'all make sure you support the Pocket Watching show. Very critical, um, you know, most particularly in terms of catching people who are scamming folks at one of the worst. <laughs> I mean, this is economically a horrible period, but you got people in our, in, in you know, uh, other black folk who are, are primarily looking to scam other black folk. Between uh, JT and um, and Pink Book, man, they've been killing it on politicians and scammers in the business community. So yeah, check, just definitely support uh, Pocket Watching with JT. Um, but yeah, so, you know, it, it, this linkage, you know, with um, only select segments of the, the contemporary population, right. right? Namely through visual imagery along the lines of BLM. You know, so it's, it's supposed to give us this idea that BLM is, is are the torch bearers for this long history mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of anti-racist behavior and so on and so forth. And I think this this works with the kind of imagery that Kendi wants to create in terms of, you know, being the the darling of white liberals because it, you know, they they white liberals know who BLM is. Right. You don't have to explain who BLM. You you show them a crowd of black people with BLM t-shirts or you know on a march and they go they know where to go with that. That it's easy. You know, you don't want to get into the 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 nuance of say other black folk calling out BLM for um, their fuckery, right? And the, the kind of behavior they've, they've engaged in, let alone Kendi himself. So, you know, you, you find it interesting how these kind of things play out in terms of what Kendi's in trouble for, what BLM, what happened to BLM a couple of years ago. You start to see it kind of come out in a very particular way. So I found this, this documentary interesting in terms of who they chose to champion and who they chose to ignore and who's in trouble right now especially as it relates to, you know, donated white dollars. Mm -hmm. When you start talking about millions of dollars being donated by white liberals, most particularly to black yeah. organizations, right now you got to deal with, you know, this management of funds and whatnot. Then, then, you know, folks don't know how to handle it. Yeah. The white cookie jar is sticky. Okay. Mm. Mm. But, it, but I, that's why I really wanted to nail in that this is a political piece. Yes, you know, it's not a it's not a benign kind of just objective historical analysis. And I would argue there's very little of that. I think most pieces tend to be subjective and that's not inherently bad. But to me, at least, you know, present yourself accordingly. And they don't. I, I think it was kind of heavy handed. I mean, it was pretty much obvious the slant they would do that they were actually using. They use uh, all the all the slides and and and, and photographs were mostly black. I, I would say ninety percent black men. Mm -hmm. But the but the focus in the in the lens was actually on black women. Yeah, and, but and and those men were were rarely, if ever, mentioned. Right. It, it was almost as if you know whoever was managing the interviews and whoever was doing the editing on the visuals mm -hmm. were, <laughs> were not in communication. <laughs> And whoever was doing the visuals did not get the memo. So they they were just putting up clips of everybody. But, you know, uh, but like I said, the, the only people that were referenced and given opportunity to speak were, were all women, except for Kendi. And then the imagery was just kind of all over based on whatever the subject was at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, but to me, a lot of this was solipsism, what I consider to be solipsism manifest. In other words, you know, it it it, it just really put on display how easily you could you could reshift how you talk about black history in a manner that excludes men. And, and I'm going to get into in a little bit, you know, where I think that comes from and why and how they might even rationalize it. But this is one of the things we're seeing. We're seeing it in the academy. 
We're seeing it in, you know, the publications that are coming out of Africana Studies. We're even seeing it at the conferences. I mean, I've, I've been attending conferences in Africana Studies since the early 90s, and I've seen the sea change in who comes and who's present and who isn't. I've seen the sea change in terms of, uh, you know, and I've, and I've shared on my Facebook page as I'm at these conferences, what's happening. You'll literally see maybe 10 presentations, and this was maybe eight, nine years ago. You see 10 presentations um, on black males. And by 10, I mean, there will be two sessions at the conference and there may be three to five people presenting at each. So that's the 10. Okay. Two, so two sessions, right? Three to five people. Now, those three to five people will often not show up. You're lucky if one will show up to give their presentation, but they're scheduled, right? At the same conference, and again, this is eight or nine years ago, you would see up to 40 plus, 40 to 70 presentations on black women and girls same conference and they're there so you can look around and i'm talking about the you know um uh, uh national council for black studies conferences like you'll go and it'll be it if i said 85 percent women i i'd say that with confidence yeah right? very few men present and that in and of itself is is really kind of reflected in men's posture in the academy, especially in black studies, where you have a lot of guys that are just not going to say anything to rock the boat, not going to say anything to get in trouble. They don't want to be, uh, you know, kind of attacked by their colleagues or at least uh, by people in the field. And that doesn't even get into what can happen if you're falsely accused of something you didn't do. All of these are layers yeah. of bullying, I argue, that takes place. And now it's at such a point where you have plenty of men that just don't want to say anything. They don't want to say anything at all. Yeah. Right? yeah. Keep your head down and try to survive. Yeah. And I think Kendi, in, to some extent, understands that, you know, coming at this from a black feminist standpoint, you kind of buy, you kind of buy a degree of loyalty mm -hmm. uh, by foregrounding black feminists. Uh, and I'm not saying he's not one, I, you know, I, I'm just being introduced to his work. He may be to the, you know, diehard feminist to the ground, but, at the end of the day, whether he's a feminist or not, he understands politics well enough to know that if you want to keep, you know, from being attacked arbitrarily, because you'll be attacked just as a just being a man. You don't even have to talk about gender. Right. You know, it, you'll be attacked by black women in the field, in the academy by itself. But if you, you but you can buy that out if you can if you can tout BLM as something you're associated with and you foreground black women. And he's done so in this piece to such a degree where black men are not even part of the fucking history which makes no sense to me whatsoever. No yeah. sense to me, but you know, this, that's what I mean when I say solipsism manifests. It, it, you can actually present this as if black men don't exist and nobody says anything. Nobody says anything. That's the problem. Even yeah. though they might know the truth or know that this is, uh, has been slanted. Nobody says anything. Yeah. I saw one nationalist, you know, kind of based discussion on this and they, were hard pressed to find the language to articulate anti-black misandry, meaning, you know, the, the outright hatred and elimination of mm -hmm. black men from the narrative, the kind of, you know, as we apply anti-black misandry to this discussion, mm -hmm. right. They, they, they had no language for it whatsoever. And I know they read Tommy Curry's work. I know yeah. for a fact that those guys read Tommy Curry's work, but you'll find very little discussion. They didn't know how to say it. They were hopping from one foot to the other, not to offend, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it, it's, you know, so we're at this point where men don't know how to call out misandry. They don't know how to challenge and, 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 and respond to um, inhumane, uh, you know, uh, forms of feminism. Um, and, and in doing so, you just end up supporting its ascendancy because right. there's no pushback. No, yeah, there's none. There's none. And then whatever pushback there is, has been uh, silenced almost immediately. So. It, it, absolutely. You know, which is which is why critical spaces uh, where, you know, uh, people can speak freely, you know, is going to become more and more important. We know that as it is. But for black men to do so, it's important that we actually, you know, not only continue to develop our voice, but to maintain it. Um, and, and I want to see that happen because these things are continuing to happen. And the silencing and the elimination of, of, of black males uh, continues with no response no acknowledgement it just we we treat it as if this is the definition of what it means to be progressive you know and i told you before we started i think progressivism as far as black men are concerned has become a form of cuckolding what did you call it you, you said it was something else emasculation yeah yeah emasculation yeah yeah 
Well, you you were supporting uh, Passport uh, OG. OG. Shout yeah, out to yeah, the brother. Yeah, 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 he mask you easy. <laughs> right. So shout out to E40. Right. <laughs> Passport OG E40. You know, y'all know what it is. <laughs> but it's become it's become common, right? And I think that's kind of what we're dealing with in pieces like this. So as as more pieces like this are made and presented as objective, benign, scholarly in some way. And they're well-funded. I mean, this is not something somebody did on their laptop and put on YouTube. This is Mm -hmm. something that you could tell has some funding to it. You know, this presents to people who who don't know any different as this must be true. This must be more accurate. And of course, a lot of the the information was accurate in terms of the the ideas, the racial, the racist ideas they were addressing. You know, but again, the, the, the kind of subtle emasculation and absence of men from the historical narrative and from being able to make commentary on it is interesting because Kendi himself says nothing about black men to any you know, of any significance. He, he's, he's a black male face mm-hmm. who's behind the book, who's behind the film, but he doesn't say anything about black men and he gives voice. He gives, you know, the black male voice over as if black men don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Except to be uh, in the background as uh, hapless victims of white supremacy. Right. That that the uh that Mary Sue has to come in and rescue us from. Ah, Mary Sue. <laughs> so the same thing happening in many an MCU movie is definitely happening in the academy and most particularly happening in black studies. Mm-hmm. Uh, now the difference, no, nah, actually I think it's a similarity. One similarity between black and white feminists uh as it as it relates to how they rationalize the absence of men is to suggest that because there was this period that we're all supposed to agree on where where you know black women were purposely removed from the narrative by black men uh, and i've heard these narratives also art- articulated in blm the response is that black men need to sit down and be quiet and black women and black lgbt groups need to take the mic and this is this has been i'd say the last decade of what we've started to hear as it relates to activist circles, you know, articulating to the mainstream. Have you heard that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It, it's been, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's almost standard. I mean, how can you not hear it? It's it's definitely what I've been hearing a lot of, and a lot of it, you know, in in black circles mm-hmm. is uh, shout out to Passport. I see him in there. What's good with you, man? Um. Now, a lot of it is is really kind of done with a sense of um, what would you call it? Uh, a sense of uh, righteous vengeance in a way, right? Mm-hmm. There's kind yeah. of a sense that you know that this is that black men are on the wrong side of history because of the past. They have to correct it, and our job is to sit down and be quiet. And whatever narrative they present, we right. just you know need to accept. In other words, it's their turn, and they, they've been ignored for two hundred years, and. And they finally have a voice, and they got the mic. So sit down and and uh, and you know sit over in the seat and be driven. Okay, sit, sit over and be driven. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So this this piece here, if you haven't seen it, um, you know, it, it, I mean, I, a, a couple of images here show you the actresses who um, who kind of played uh, characters like Harriet Jacobs and um, uh, Phyllis Wheatley. So, you know, so that as the, as you're hearing the, the, you know, the, the people talking about various things, as mm-hmm. I said earlier, they're showing you, you know, actors and actresses who are playing out certain parts alongside film clips, uh, cartoon clips, commercial clips, imagery from current day, uh, protests to historical periods. You're seeing all of this presented as this jumbled together collage that's supposed to trigger, you know, your, your reverence for black history. And of course, you know, uh, the imagery there. Now they spend, I would argue the majority of the time on, uh, as far as the historical area, they spent more time on Phyllis Wheatley, Harriet Jacobs and Ida B. Wells than they did on anything else. I mean, you can tell me if you saw that differently. It was, I think the, uh, the, the pieces were, they were like 10 minutes long on each of them. So uh, like a third of the film, the documentary was actually focused on those three people. Right. Right. You know, uh, and so that kind of lets you know the focus. And they talked about, you know, the, you know, the, their literary productions and how it changed uh, America, how it challenged the status quo. Right. And I'm not arguing that it did. 
I'm not saying that. What I am saying is when you present this in the way you, you are, I think especially when you're talking about a population of boys, mm-hmm. black boys who are having difficulty, you know, extreme difficulty with literacy, extreme difficulty with K through 12 education, extreme difficulty with, with really, you know, wanting to participate in society and in the community. I think doing these kind of things doesn't help in, in regard to the elimination of black boys. Um, it, you know, what are your thoughts on that? It, yeah, it, it, this is something that we see, man, in, in the movies. We see it in, 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 in film. We see it in the cartoons, basically the re- the, the uh, devolvement of boys and the centering of black females as heroes. Okay, that's why yeah. I call them Mary Sue's. Okay, in other words, these three women, just by their writing and their force of nature, right, change the whole direction of the black struggle. You know, mm-hmm. seemingly by themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, and and like I said, the uh, and black women were these hapless victims, except for the Civil War, where they actually volunteered and died. Okay. But the thing is, is that, uh, you know, even when uh, Thomas Jefferson was, you know, raping and and and, uh, and, and, have, and having children all over the place, man, with his slaves, okay, uh, black women were actually uh, protecting black men's honor and actually calling out uh, white, you know, white male slavery and, and stuff like that. So, it was, you know, but that is the, that's, that's why I call it the Mary Sueism of, of, of black male history, of black history, period. Yeah. They, they've revised the entire approach to black yeah, history yeah. and made it about, and this is, this is considered a reversal from, you know, the old pattern, right? Right. The old pattern of, of, of how history was framed was around great white men. Yeah. And so the argument is that when you had works done in the black community about black history, it was centered around great black men. Great black right? men. Yes. Yeah. And, and so this is considered this kind of righteous vindication in yeah. terms of flipping that from you know, great black men to great black women, yeah, and and the erasure of boys. But I think there's a couple of things that that are problematic with that. First, you got to read the room, yeah. And again, when we go back to black boys, black girls, um, especially as it relates to early education, if you're not really seeing what's going on, mm-hmm. um, the elimination of boys and men is mistimed and misunderstood on a, a number of levels. And I think that's part of the problem. Um, but I want to also get at this kind of whole um, black studies was all men and, and they ignored uh, black women, black history was all men. It was a reflection of the black nationalist movements and it focused on eliminating women. And I want to deal with that because I think there, that that's part of why this documentary is framed the way it is. It's considered justified, I think, in doing this, because if you have a problem with it, then you should understand why women are frustrated because this is the history of how, you know, supposedly black men eliminated black women from the discussion, so on and so forth. Uh, So I want to respond to that by actually looking at um, a piece. I don't know how many of you may have had a chance to ever see this uh, because I actually forget what year this came out. Um, Let me see where to go. Why is it not showing up? Hmm. Okay, I don't know why it's not letting me show it. Oh, that's why I got to scroll. There it is. All right. So this is a piece called Black Studies, Not Morality, Anti-Black Racism, Neoliberal Co-Optation and the Challenges to Black Studies Under Intersectional Intersectional Axioms by Tommy J. Curry. This is a piece that came out some years ago. This was probably... I think this might have been the first piece of his I ever read. Mm. I had some conversation with him for a while, and then he shot me this piece, and it completely said everything that many of us didn't know how to say, which, you know, Tommy has a tendency to do. Um, And so there was a lot of brothers that were really, you know, a lot of people who were taken by this piece. I know I was one of them, but I don't know if I've ever covered it on this channel, and I don't know if people are familiar with it. But it's an important piece that deals with the field of Black studies in and of itself. And he's talking about, as you can see in the title, the kind of neoliberal co-optation of the field Mm -hmm. and how very ideas from intersectionality and other, you know, other ideas have have kind of been used in the space in a manner that is uh, not only problematic, but in many respects, anti-black and yet embraced as the defining feature of blackness in the field of black studies. And so he's kind of talking about this and in many ways, even alluding to the black feminist takeover of the field 
But the takeover is not overt. It's just subtle. And a lot of it is due to our existential reality, meaning it's due to, you know, how many people are in the field who are not men. And if you look at the graduation rates right. from, from college to graduate school, it, that's that's, you know, it's a, that's how we get to this. You know, it, it, you know, in terms of and, and even in terms of, um, you know, looking at the percentages of black males going into school, depending on where you're looking at. Uh, if you're looking at places like Fresno State, you'll find the numbers of ADOS men are abysmally. significantly low, abysmally, abysmally. so. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's having an impact on who's even in the room to have these discussions. And nobody's really talking. I don't I don't think enough people are talking about the fact that you have black males who by the eighth grade, 70 percent of which are still illiterate. Mm hmm. And, and we're not going to talk about what impact that has. I don't care if you're talking about blue collar trade work. If you can't read, right? Yeah. do math or science, are you telling me it's not going to have an effect on all of those different areas? Yeah. Huge. Coding? Yeah. Can't even join the military. Yeah. Get it. Yeah. But but we're, we're not going to look at what impact that has. We're going to suggest it doesn't have one. I, I don't understand how that works. Yeah. Yeah. I think the a piece that you uh, put up, I think on Facebook, talk about that uh, that boys dream of protection, you know, being a hero, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. and protecting the family and protecting you know people yeah. early on about being uh, envisioning themselves as a as a protector, as a hero, okay. Mm -hmm. Where this is the you know what's going on is the opposite, framing women as the protector and the hero. Yeah, and not allowing boys to really see themselves in mm -hmm. that role. Mm -hmm. And and again, we're going to act like that doesn't impact boys over time. So um, I think what you're referring to is. Uh, hold on. I, I think it was a, 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 I think it was a, a, a thumbnail or a piece, a cut where a woman says that she was so shocked that boys actually envision themselves as a protector or, or as a hero or acted yeah. out in their heads. Yeah. Let me see if I can. Uh, hold on. I'll come back to that because I think uh, I think I know which one you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, here we go. So it's going to be a little messy on the screen, I guess. Is that the one you? It, it, yeah. I think this is it. So this is apparently this is a post uh, from you know it looks to be a woman. And it says, "Wait, boys have fake scenarios of them saving people." <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's supposed to be the clip in and of itself. And so my commentary, you know, just on top of that, you know. Um, I know it's probably hard to see. Let's see if I can. I guess that's not helping, is it? Yeah, it is. Uh, it is. Yeah. So it says, I said, yes, it's preparatory, preparatory training to protect families. Mess with that at your peril. Wait, what am I talking about? Society dismissed boys decades ago. Yes. Yeah. And women are already. What do we hear from black women? We that don't. Black protect. women are not protected. And they don't feel safe. They don't feel safe. They don't feel protected. Well, you know, again, if, if you deny them. The, the means to see themselves as protectors, let alone the training they get from mm -hmm. grown men mm -hmm. on how to actually protect, what do you think you get? Yeah. If you primarily fund and focus on the women and prioritize them and foreground them and literally ignore the boys until you're upset that the boys are quoting Kevin Samuel Samuels and, and Andrew Tate. Yeah. And then the only time you mention them is to figure out how to get them to stop quoting them, but you're still not investing anything in them. Yes. But now you're upset that the traditional expectations of malehood are no longer present. Yeah. They go together. Yeah. yeah. They go together. I mean, what you want to ra raise revolutionary men, the thing is you want to ask you to be servants of females. Yeah. Yeah. And then get mad yeah. that you created a group of servants of females that don't know how to do the things females expect. They expect that. Yeah. From men. Yes. Yeah, you know, so that's part of what, you know, we're looking at. But I want to, this piece here, and I'm going to try not to read the whole thing, but, you know, this, this <laughs> is so well done, it's hard. Um, you know, so Black Studies Not Morality. I want to respond to the accusation mm -hmm. of this period where Black Studies, uh, activism, history, all of it was just a reflection of, you know, androcentric or male-centered political activism and thus eliminated women and girls from from the uh, from the conversation. Uh, and and again, this is what produces Kendi's documentary. Mm -hmm. He's doing this in such manner that if you raise complaint about it, 
Right. Then you know you're 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 misandrist. You know, you, I mean, you're you're uh, misogynist. You you're, and you're not only a misogynist, but you're you've overlooked that this has happened the other way around, and black men have eliminated black women, and mm -hmm. therefore you know you're not accepting that history. So Curry goes into some detail about this, and it's just a matter of trying to determine how much I want to read. <laughs> so oh, shit, this is hard because I want to read all of it, but you know, anyway, so I'll just, I'll, I'll just try and read through some of this and then we'll get uh, BGS's responses to what I read. So I'll just start arbitrarily uh, here. So it says, uh, focusing almost exclusively on the disagreements and scholarship produced in the 1970s and, and understand the seventies was the time period, seventies, sixties and seventies, is, is really what people are talking about when they're uh, blaming black men for the elimination of black women from, mm -hmm. the, from the narrative, right? Um, so uh, canonical texts continue to use this moment to frame the need for an intersectional, read I, black feminist intervention into the culture of black sexism, supposedly demonstrated by black men in their critiques of Wallace. Now he's talking about Michelle Wallace, Michelle Wallace yeah. author of Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman. So for example, Patricia Hill Collins argues in Black Feminist Thought 2000 uh, that the virulent reaction to earlier Black women's writings by some Black men, such as Robert Staples' analysis of Inosaki Shange's choreo poem for colored girls who have considered suicide, mm -hmm. and Michelle Wallace's controversial volume, Black Macho and the Myth of, Super of the Superwoman, illustrates the difficulty of challenging the masculinist bias in Black social and political thought. But her account here is incomplete, this is Curry, as well as inaccurate. Like the works and authors mentioned above, she she attempts to perpetuate a historical narrative aimed at masculinizing the criticisms of Wallace's text. Collins suggests to readers that it was only black men who reacted negatively to the black macho and that the reaction of black men was due primarily to them being black, male and sexist. However, even a brief survey of that May, June 1979 issue of the Black Scholar reveals that black women also criticized Wallace's work and Sean Gay's poem, deploying arguments very similar to that of their black male counterparts. Julianne, right. Julianne Malveaux's The Sexual Politics of Black People, Ang Angry Black Women and Angry Black Men, argued that Sean Gay's choreo po poem is just a poem, nothing more, and a poem is not a polemic, and that mm -hmm. Wallace's work, her book, is being hyped because, um, I'm about to lose my place, because it is what white people want to hear. Right. It's Gloria yep. Steinem's characterization of it as the book of the 80s, anything more than wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. um, right? so, um, Shirley A. Williams's comment on the curb agreed with Staples arguing that Shange and Wallace do not fully understand the culture they set out to describe and examine. Actually, the harshest criticism of the time did not come from Robert Staples. It came from Paula Giddings' article, The Lessons of History Will Shape the 80s. The Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman Won't. Mm. Giddings accuses Wallace's work of furthering a white supremacist agenda rooted in an agenda ridden revisionism of black history. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yes. Yeah, it does. A white supremacist, uh, supremacist agenda rooted in an agenda ridden revisionism of black history. Now, just to kind of put this in some context, even though he's talking about Wallace and he, mm. he's talking about Michelle Wallace, he's talking about Endosaki Shange, and he's talking about their particular publications. What he's still responding to is the 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 black sexism uh, accusation toward black men as a whole. Right, right. And he's saying oh, color what? purple, color purple. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and one of uh, uh, uh got a groove back. You know, yes. um, yeah. But what he's what he's saying, he's using these particular pieces to highlight mm -hmm. a larger argument that could be made on behalf of nationalism, politics, uh, mm -hmm. black studies as a field, even, you know, publications on black history. He's saying that this is a, this is kind of a, and these are my words, not his, this is kind of a lazy accusation being made at black men mm -hmm. that may be politically useful for key people, but it's not accurate. No. So even though he's talking about very specific productions, you know, this is a larger argument he's making. And so he argues here that Paula Giddings actually gives a more strident critique than Robert Staples, who's accused of, of giving a, a sexist critique. And if you're unfamiliar yeah. with Staples, mm -hmm. go to the Green Gorilla channel. Uh, you know, I think a couple of years ago, he posted a video interview uh, of, of Robert Staples in the 80s uh, yeah. a debate with a feminist. Um, uh, I see her face in my head, but her name escapes me right at the moment. I wasn't prepared to talk about that. But anyway, it's a really interesting uh, debate that takes place in the 80s. 
Um, so you can find it pretty easy on the Green Gorilla channel. But anyway, I'll just, uh, is there something you wanted to add to that? No, 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 go ahead. Okay, so he, he quotes Giddings. Uh, he says, Giddings argues, um, Wallace might have benefited from a more careful look at the story of Sojourner Truth, one of the Amazons she describes, particularly as it pr parallels the situation today. An ex-slave, Truth was involved with the 19th century feminist movement or the suffragette movement, as it was called. Led by politically minded middle class white women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, mm -hmm. the movement was facing deterioration within its ranks, especially as it began to complete their attention and support for the more fundamental issue of the day, black rights and abolition. Mm -hmm. When it looked as if black men would get the vote before black women would, Stanton mm -hmm. showed her true colors, even going so far as to say it would be better for a black woman to be the slave of an educated white man than of a degraded, ignorant black woman. That, that is true. That's what she said. Yeah. Truth yep. didn't. Truth didn't go to that link, but she echoed echoed Stanton's basic sentiments. Wallace quotes her speech as a at an 1867 Equal Rights Association convention. There is a great stir about colored men getting their rights and not colored women. Mm -hmm. And if colored men get their rights and not colored women theirs, you mm -hmm. see the colored men will be masters over their women, mm -hmm. and it will be just as bad okay. as before. In other words, you take it would be just as bad as a white Southern slave master. Yeah. Right. But Wallace breaks off the quote. Another part of the same speech clarifies the perspective from which Sojourner Truth spoke. White women are a great deal smarter and know more than colored women, while colored women know scarcely anything. They go out washing, which is about as high as colored women gets or colored women gets. And their men go uh, go about idle, strutting up and down. And when the women come home, they ask for their money and take it all and then scold uh, and then scold because there is no food. I want you to consider that chilling. Mm. Um, so it says, despite the harshness of the criticism by Giddings, Alexander Floyd's aforementioned work only cites this Giddings article insofar as it mentions that the black macho was heralded as the book that would shape the 80s by then Miss Mrs. Miss editor, uh, Miss Magazine's editor, Gloria Steinem. So in other words, what, what Curry is saying here is you know, they do acknowledge women's critique of feminist productions like this, but they used it to only uh, bolster feminist productions. So Giddings, even though she has a harsh critique for Wallace's work, we only see the sentence that the book, uh, Wallace's book was heralded, right? As the book yeah. that would shape the eighties, not the critique that Giddings af actually offers. This is an important point for us to acknowledge here because what he's saying is that it presents the idea that you had this all women against all men narrative. Mm -hmm. And thus they could point the finger righteously so at black men as being sexist and continue that narrative into 2023, where we're going to, we're about to witness the rebirth of the color purple. Yeah. Um, and, you know, which again was a huge part in that accusation toward black men, right? Black men, it's always Jermaine's fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if you could rename the color purple, you could rename it. It's always Jermaine's fault. <laughs> Because that was the definitive production of the 80s that I think really laid that idea out there. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. so what. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. So, so what he's saying here is, you know, that even though they want to feminists in particular want to present uh, that there was this this history, both in the activist community and in the academy where black men uh, were sexist and they just stamped on anything black women did. He's saying that actually there were a plethora of men and women that were right. critical of black feminists early productions. And if you're not familiar with Michelle Wallace's work, you're not familiar with Inosaki Shange's work. These are foundational pieces to black mm -hmm. feminism. Mm -hmm. Even though I have a lot of black feminist students now that don't even know what those works are, interestingly enough. Yeah, but those they, are foundational. Well, yeah, they know the, the derivative works from from those uh, two books. Yeah, exactly. Because the patterns keep, uh, keep repeating, including this one, including the documentary that we just saw. Same, yeah. you know, the same thing. And that's what I'm trying to say here. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing with uh, Kendi is the continuation of the black feminist argument. Now, mm -hmm. it's a little ham handed. I think it's a little self-serving mm -hmm. and, and it just might be, you know, something he's doing for dollars. I, I can't, you know, I have no idea about his commitment to feminism or not. That's just my first impression based on the film. But at the end of the day, whether it's sincere or whether it's just done as, in, as a hustle, as a hustle. Right. Either way, it still stands on this legacy of feminism that begins by falsely accusing black men of just being one dimensional 
um, you know, uh, uh, beings that, that just, you know, can't wait to downplay women and dismiss them and so on and so forth. Yeah. And it, you know, so th- it, that's critical. Right. So he continues. He says this citation and paraphrasing not only misrepresents Giddings actual work, but again, is an example of how many black feminist authors erase the criticisms of authoritative black women academics to preserve the mythology that all of the criticisms against Wallace were waged from and driven by the sexism of black men. In sociology specifically, black women intellectuals reacted harshly to the decades of work already solidified and the empirical work by black men and women being ignored by Wallace's text. In LaFrancis Rogers Rose's preface to The Black Woman, 1980, she, like Collins, argues that historically black women have been written about by white social scientists who mm-hmm. have not lived the experience of black womanhood, nor have they made an earnest effort to be introspective learners. According to Rogers Rose, it w- it has only been in the past 10 years or so that the negative perceptions of black women have seriously been challenged. The works of Bell and Parker, Billingsley, uh, Cade, Crutchfield, Davis, Gutman, Harley, and Turborg Penn, Hill, Johnson, and Green, Ladner, Lerner, Mossel, Nobles, Staples, and Walker are all part of the growing social scientific literature that questions the validity of the prevailing characterizations of Black women. Mm. Right? I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because, like I said, I'll, I'll mess around and read this whole paper, and there might be three people watching. I don't know. <laughs> BGS done checked out. I'm still reading it. Three people watching. I, you know. But if you haven't had a chance, you can find this on, I think it's it's either academia, I think it's academia.com. Okay, it's on academia, yeah. Yeah, you can look for Tommy J. Curry, um, uh, Black Studies, Not Morality. You can read through it yourself. Um, but I, I do want to at least give you one more section. And let me just um, let me see if there's anything I definitely want to cover in this one. Um Mm, 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 mm. All right, fuck it. I'll just read through it. While black feminists have offered a history of uh, a, his, a history telling of the hostility towards black women's concern and resistance towards the study of black women during the decades marking the decline of black power and the rise of black studies, other black scholar activist accounts tell a different story. Joyce Ladner's Tomorrow's Tomorrow, originally published in 1971, was a pioneering study of black girls in St. Louis in the 1960s. Ladner's work utilized the theoretical frameworks of W.E.B. Du Bois and the dawning methodologies of Black sociology articulated in her later work, The Death of White Sociology, published two years later in 1973. In Tomorrow's Tomorrow, Ladner argues that Black women do not perceive their enemy to be Black men, but rather the enemy is considered to be the oppressive forces in the larger society, which subjugate Black men, women, and children. Another critic of Wallace's text was, was a now erased Black female activist working with the Sojourner Truth Organization in Chicago, Illinois, in the 70s, named Allison Edwards. Edwards was the author of Rape, Racism, and, and the White Women's Movement, 1979. A 54-page publication primarily dedicated to refuting the racist logic of Susan Brown Miller's Against Our Will, Men, Women, and Rape. Edwards argued that Wallace's text failed or fails on multiple scholarly grounds. So she's talking about um, um, uh, Myth of the Black Macho. Saying the book fails on multiple scholarly grounds, logical and historical Marxist and Freudian, lacking the theoretical nuance of Freudian, uh, Freudians who attend to sexuality among historical and unconscious concerns. Edwards remarks that it is hard to take seriously a treaty on uh, a treatise on black history, which reduces 400 years of slavery and oppression on the one hand and survival resistance and revolution on the other to the individual male's pursuit of individual male power to be attained by virtue of a supposedly superior individual male sexual organ. Mm, mm. It is in fact capitulation to the worst aspect of both white supremacist and male chauvinist sexual stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'll just kind of skip to this last paragraph and we can discuss from there. So in short, the disciplinarity of black studies, its relationship to the sexism of the Black Panther Party specifically, and the ideology of Black power more generally is much more complicated than the aforementioned text present. In other words, the feminist accusation that Black men, you know, were vehemently dismissing Black women, right. and this is why you need a stamp from the beginning documentary and book to foreground women, because there's this history of Black men eliminating women from the discussion. Curry is basically saying these types of arguments uh, are, are they, they lack nuance and they're, yeah. they're, 
you know, they're, they're really myth myths in and of themselves. He says, uh, the reality is there are many different impressions of this era and none of them will be answered to the service of black people. If we create mythology to justify, mm -hmm. justify our reading of history, rather than criteria for what constitutes evidence of how we see history itself. This is not to deny that sexism, like any other social inequality, classism, chauvinism, homophobia, and even anti-blackness exists in black studies or was internalized by members of the Black Panther Party. It is, however, a denial of causality, which suggests that the failures of one historical moment is essential to the discipline or the, uh, uh, or the male bodies within it. Vivian Verdell Gordon's Black Women, Feminism, and Black Studies, for example, has argued that although many Black women have been victimized by an unanticipated sexism by Black men, such women in Black Studies have often found extensive support from other or their male and female peers who have worked together to combat such destructive forces. Gordon's analysis of Black Studies comes alongside her observation of the near complete rejection of black women hired or studied in women and gender studies departments during the same time. Now, I will also add to this mm -hmm. that although Curry writes this, um, that's within the, I want to say it's within the last decade. I don't. Yeah. See, um, yeah. I think it was 2015, maybe. I'm not sure. He sent it to me um, when he finished it. And I'm not. Hold on. I'm going to try and see if I at least have the date or the year uh, year that he sent it to me. I got 2014. So, yeah. But okay. in, so in, in the last nine years, I mean, so he writes this nine years ago. Um, I think the discussion since this piece, including what Curry himself has produced, has shown that it's not only just been a one way dynamic that we can talk about. And this is where we go into my book, where mm -hmm. we actually can look at the way you had certain black women who were empowered and were able to use their position to downplay boys and men and foreground women and girls to the detriment of the community, but the betterment of themselves. And, and so you can see this happening. But again, it primarily comes down to resources that the black community doesn't produce for itself. Right. But resources that are extended to certain black people by white society. And yeah. so that's kind of what I'm looking at here when we talk about this. Uh, we're really looking at the ways in which uh, certain empowered uh, figures are in a position to apply these agendas uh, intra-racially within the community toward each other. And this is what we're seeing when we watch Stamp from the beginning. We're watching, um, you know, this this idea that Black men need to be, uh, you know, Black women need to be avenged. And I've even heard this in BLM, where this argument is that, you know, Black men used to run things, and now it's time for you to sit down and shut up and let us take over because you guys have been sexist and so on and so forth. So I think Curry's argument here, mm -hmm. which, you know, I think it, it is written right around the time we start to see the rise of BLM, right, is to suggest that a lot of this argumentation against Black men is it lacks nuance. It's it's not particularly detailed. It's it's a it's a fairy tale myth that is comfortable. Yeah, it's easy to remember, easy to digest, and then easy to avenge without qualification. It may be even orchestrated. You know? And orchestrated. No, I agree. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. You're right. Very much orchestrated uh, in many respects. And and so even the men, the anger you hear online, the anger you hear in social media and in other productions from men is often in the black community is a response to a, a variety of levels of, of attack, right? Attack that feminists justify as, 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 a, as a response to historical uh, yeah. sexism yeah. And in many ways, um, you know, again, is, is very much orchestrated and used to attack men outright. So you're seeing it in the academy. When you start talking to men about uh, worrying about losing their jobs, well, one of the reasons they're worried about losing them is who's in positions of authority, right? right? Yeah. Uh, and who's promoting those positions of authority. But then again, who's graduating to even get into positions <laughs> in the academy to get eventually into positions of authority and who isn't graduating. We see this taking place in family courts where even in terms of family production, we can see which mm -hmm. individuals get the nod in family court mm -hmm. as far as child support, alimony, so on and so forth, child custody, mm -hmm. all of these things have an impact, right? And so we're seeing, and this is, these are some of the things I list out in the chapters of my book, where I'm pointing out institutionally where these different types of allotments of proxy power go in the black community as it relates to the state. 
and they primarily do not go to black men. Black men get theirs out of the mud to the extent that they get it. Right. We are doing better than and worse than despite a lack of support, not because, you know, and I say when I say better than I'm saying, yeah, you have a slightly higher number of black men making six figures than black women, even though we're told that black women run circles around us. Right. So we're doing better than. But then when you look at and you and I have talked about this a lot. When you look at black men who are homeless, who are unemployed, when mm-hmm. you, you know, our numbers far exceed any other demographic in the black community. Yeah, so we're doing yeah. better than and worse than despite a lack of support. Well, go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, uh, look, look at this film recentering uh, uh, black women as heroes, as, as standouts. And, and uh, I, re- I remember, remember that I, it was years ago, I think it was. Uh, a female march on Washington, I do believe, and the black woman was saying, uh, "Let black women lead." Sorry, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So this stuff is uh, like it's coming to a to to a to to a head. Oh, so yeah. what, what happened with Michelle Wallace and uh, and, and, and and was it Kendi? Not Kendi, but it was her Kendi? name, Ashango. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, wait, so, who are you? We're well, talking about saying... the, for color girls, you know. Oh, Sh- uh, Indosaki Shango. Okay. Shango, okay. yeah, yeah, or Shange. John Gay. In other yeah. words, in other words, what they start is now coming to fruition. You know, back uh, with Kendi. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's always been political. It's always been about political power. You know? And sectionality is about bl- uh, black female political power. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. And we're we're but we're taught to see it as you know just a benign mm-hmm. push. You know, for women to you know kind of yeah. uh, you know, be restored from historical racism, mm-hmm. and yet. You know, we, we we're looking at this political ascendancy, and and most of us are not calling it out for what it is. When they made demands on Biden, for mm-hmm. example, to have a, a black female vice president, mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, y'all looking at this? Yeah. Not to it's not the demand; it's the capacity by which the this person has to address the command that should yeah. tell you something. Yeah, and, and then acceded to their wishes. And acceded to their wishes, right? Mm-hmm. With with someone who was famously known for not only locking black men up in the bay, but even <laughs> locking black mothers up in the bay. Uh, I was like, yeah, damn, y'all ain't gonna look at none of this? <laughs> All I can say is two peas in a pod. They, they belong to each other, huh? Yeah. Not a lot of people frustrated very, very frustrated dumb. at me for calling that out, but I'm like, yo, it, you know, I'm not opposed to having a woman in the executive office, but I am opposed to your rationale for why and who you're picking based on what. Mm-hmm. You know, that to me is the problem. But this this goes to something you just said a moment ago that I want to I want to just quickly point out, uh, you know, in regard to BLM and, and this. You said the March on Washington. And this is a this is a quote that I found uh, that I thought was important. Um, so this was this was from an article that I found years ago. I wrote this blog piece in 2017. So that's, you know, what, uh, about six years ago. Mm-hmm. Right. And and title of the blog piece is Silly Rabbit Tricks of Kids. BLM was not for you after all. Right. <laughs> and if you look at the first first opening quote is which is what this is. It says, contrary to the widely held misconceptions that Black Lives Matter was founded solely for men or boys. Alicia Garza, Patrice uh, Colors and I created Black Lives Matter for black women. This mm. is coming from Opal Tometi. Now, I'm going to check, you know, while we're live. Um and see, oh, well, I don't, I don't have access to the Washington Post anymore. But last time I checked this article, when I went to the source, mm-hmm. they cha- they removed the quote altogether. Mm-hmm. Wow. So this goes to what you were saying about the way that they're kind of cleaning up. And I think I put this in the book. So you have this quote from one of the founders of BLM saying that it was never about men or boys. It is specifically, now she said, it's not about men or boys, it's about the community. I can respect that. I'm like, okay, I can, I can live with that. But when you say it's not about men or boys, it is specifically about women. And then that quote disappears from the article. I'm like, OK. Yeah. Yeah. They Stop. revised it. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're cleaning up just like they did on their website where they removed the section on the nuclear family, i.e. black men in the family. Right? <laughs> yeah, These kind of things, you know, I take issue with. So, you know, in terms of, you know, what you're saying, we're, we're witnessing that. But I thought it was important to cite that. And I'm glad I kept it. And and put it in my own in my own words because when it disappeared, I went back to it years ago just mm-hmm. to kind of you know look at it again, and it was gone. Yeah, like whoa. 
<laughs> yeah, that's why you I have my big ass Evernote, right? They yeah. actually save things because they do change. Some things you can't find anymore. Man, I wish I didn't drag my feet on Evernote, man. You've been telling <laughs> me about it for years. And I just, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, nah, these websites will be there later. You know, I'll yeah. just get it later. And no. Yeah. No, you can't make those assumptions anymore. But anyway, so as far as Ibram X, Kendi, and this particular piece, now I didn't read the book. And I'm not really, I didn't go through any of his other work. I just watched this film. Mm -hmm. I knew about what was going on with his center and the, you know, questions about, you know, what's going on with the funding and so on and so forth. He responded and he argued, you know, that this is, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but he's got long-term plans and it's not what it looks like. It's, you know, mm -hmm. nobody embezzling. There's no funds missing per se. It's just, you know, <laughs> he, he fired half his staff because it's just the short term you know, a momentary thing that needs to reset, that kind of thing. Eh, I, you know, I just looked at it and said, all right, put that on the shelf. Come back to it later. Where where have we heard that before? Hey, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm wondering. It sounds really familiar. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Like, yeah, like when they were buying houses with the money, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if any of that money's been paid back, it, it, given to the people in equal amounts or anything of that nature. I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, maybe it has, and we just never heard it from anybody. You know, so I don't know. Um, but I'd say this film is written it, almost for a high school population. I mean, I, I, I would think so. Yeah, it seems more like a high school population. Yeah, it looks but like you can, argue, you can argue that's most of uh, Black America. So. Oh, shit. God damn it, PK. <laughs> Damn it, man. Nowhere, man. I'm not going to, I know you can't take me anywhere. <laughs> damn, man. <laughs> I would, but I would agree. I, I would say this is targeted at a high school education level, mm -hmm. you know, kind of audience. Mm -hmm. But it is enough to change. This is basically, you know, this is what you saw Oprah do in the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. Oprah, she kind of made really complicated and nuanced issues in the 1980s. She made them armchair subjects mm -hmm. and she prioritized a, a black women kind of gynefocal approach to this that made uh you know made things kind of subject to what black women wanted to hear and what they did mm -hmm. and once she did that you know i think it took off like wildfire so you have you have generations of feminists who never call themselves feminists right they don't actually use that term and they've never actually sat and read a feminist book no. not, you know the literary or in academic literature unless they've been to college and they've taken classes in gender studies mm -hmm. You're talking about people who've actually never read a feminist text, but no. they're still spouting feminist talking points that they learn from popular media. Like a like a fish doesn't know water. Hey. We're surrounded by it. Hey. And he drinks it every day. Yeah. But can't tell you what water is. Mm -mm. You know, and I run into a lot of these young feminists, and I and truthfully, not just young. I mean, from middle school age to women in their 60s and 70s who've just been operating by a certain set of precepts that they learn from popular culture, which, you know, kind of boil down to man, bad woman, good, inherently. So. Yeah. Yeah. M you Mr. Know. Mr. And Seeley still live. huh? Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. And they're about to be reinvented just to make sure that the new generation has the new inoculation. Right. <laughs> Booster wanna, shot, huh? <laughs> yeah. You want to talk about vaccines? Talk about that one. <laughs> Media vaccines are no joke. This is not, I mean, yeah, they're making money or trying to with the new uh, color purple, but that's not all it is. They want to re, they want to reassure, you know, that, that they can, in, you know, reinstall this narrative mm -hmm. that, you know, the same narrative that we kind of see being, you know, generically referenced in this film in terms of, it's really referenced by, by any, by not having any outward demonstrative statement about it, but you can see the argument toward it by not having any men comment at all any men of note even really being there's they, they didn't do any kind of you know substantive statement on you know du bois you know uh, uh, you know it, it, there's so many different figures you could name and and truth be told there are a lot of black male figures in black history that most people don't know about right that could have easily been brought up and have made significant contributions i mean we talked about this remember when we did a review of um and the movement, the movie on Harriet Tubman. Yes. Yep. Uh, and yep. we talked, we talked about, you know, the brother who the actually, 
Oh, go ahead. I'm talking about bigger long. <laughs> oh, hell, not that bullshit. Right? <laughs> so bigger long was, you know, was the stereotypical figure that yeah. feminists created in that film mm -hmm. to give Harriet Tubman a black male villain. Mm -hmm. And supposedly this guy is a slave hunter who talks, who stands around talking to white men about his, his enjoyment of white prostitutes. Mm -hmm. I don't know too many black men that would have lived through that conversation <laughs> in 1800s. Zero. <laughs> but this is who they fabricate while ignoring that you actually had a brother. And I we talked about this in the show. So if you guys are interested, go look at our review of the Harriet Tubman film. I think it's called Harriet. Um, and we talked about the brother who actually, you know, made it possible for Harriet to do that work. And he was actually the one running the railroad. And mm -hmm. we went into some depth about it, but, you know, in as much as you have historical figures that we all think we know, um, I would argue most of us don't know half as much as, as we think we know about many of the black male historical figures. But then, you know, there are many that don't get any mention at all. Mm -hmm. And so with this film, there's no attempt to provide balance. There's no attempt to provide and balance, not just on having a, a certain number of men and women represented to tick a box. But balance in the sense that if you're going to if you're going to talk about black history, you're going to include as enough enough in the narrative as possible to make sure it's understood. You know, even do, just doing that by that logic alone, you'll have black men and black women present in the discourse. This particular film goes out of its way to mm -hmm. foreground women downplay men. And again, in my humble assessment, if you have a problem with it then you should understand why women are upset about this era where black men eliminated everybody from the discussion. And so right. that's why we went to Curry and we looked at that. And I think Curry's argument still stands in this subject and on this context, in this context that, you know, much of that is a myth. Much of that accusation that has become common uh, is a myth. And, and, and if you hear people making it, you can tell that they're not immersed in the material. They're immersed and invested in an, in an agenda that is inherent, inherently misandrous. You know, uh, that's that's not their, you know, they're nothing they would admit to, but that's what we're, we're looking at. The attempt to eliminate and slander black men is an inherently misandrous tendency. And, and it's having an impact on boys and men in society. And nobody wants to talk about it, but we're seeing the effect of it. And boys are checking out for more than just dating girls. They're checking out. Yeah. And that includes suicide. Yeah, suicide. Yeah, suicide, and and uh, checking out on drugs. You know, uh, lots of different ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, um, and where you are, you you're seeing quite a bit of it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You know, so. boys checking out. Yeah, uh, boys un underachieving. Yeah, that's that's a big thing, not just here but across the planet. So yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, you know, I apologize for for holding you in this long. Um, any comments you want to give about? Where now, there's, we stand? there's one thing that that bothered me is is in this film was the uh, the, the 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 talk of uh, the black male image as far as uh, raping white women, right? And okay. it's three three versions of King Kong carrying around a white woman in his hand. Mm -hmm. That bothered me, you know. And it co comes up with this swirling trope of this uh, where black men are actually are still lust after white female flesh. But see, th th this is what we mean by, you know, flat blackness in this regard. If you're going to use visual images around King Kong, at least give us the context for where they come from. Mm -hmm. You got to talk about Jack Johnson. But yeah. if your go to is to make sure that black men aren't singled out and talked about, then you're just going to have images of King Kong and you're going to talk about swirling and you're going to talk about rape. And that's going to be it. Yeah. But there's a historical context to these images that need to be talked about, especially if you're going to call this the definitive, you know, work on the history of racist ideas. Mm -hmm. So, so Jack Johnson's experience doesn't play into that. We're still watching fucking King Kong movies. Now mm -hmm. there's been King Kong movies for every generation since Jack Johnson. And there's no discussion on where King Kong comes from or the idea around black men and white women and black men being aggressive you know, rapists, it, it, we, ah, but you have to actually say black men to address that argument. Right. Right. Instead of black people, black people. Right. Yeah. Because it, black women weren't seen as a, a, they were seen as a sexual threat, but the way they played that was, and this is particular to white males. They framed it in stereotype around the Jezebel, 
the idea was was that she tempted them mm-hmm. into sex. That was the idea. But for black men, it was never that black men seduced white women. It was that black men violated them. Yeah. Which justified their their lynching. And I noticed one other thing, which was kind of small. When they did get to lynching, they showed the image of, of a woman lynched. And mm-hmm. then they showed, you know, the image of man lynch. And I thought this was interesting because I remember seeing something similar in a BLM commercial a couple of years ago out of LA where they would talk about police homicide and they showed a woman and a man, you know, standing. Right. You know, and I thought this was a, because what essentially you're doing to people who know no better is you're presenting this as something that happens equally for yeah. men and women. Yeah. Proportionality. And, yeah. You're right. In proportionality. And you suggest that because this is happening to both, that if anybody calls this out, otherwise they're just a sexist, but, I'm like, okay, again, and I've used this example before, but it's true. You know, if we're going to talk about breast cancer, you don't see commercials with a man and a woman standing (laughs) next to each other because in terms of proportionality, this is something that impacts women far more than men. But proportionality is only acceptable as it pertains to women. It's not acceptable as it pertains to men. If if we get proportional about what happens to men, then it's sexist. Mm -hmm. If we misrepresent the imagery to give the idea that this is happening equally, equally to women and men, i.e., as you said, black people, mm-hmm. then that's somehow OK. But when you find out that 98 percent of you know, you know cases for breast cancer are happening to women and 2 percent to men, does that make sense? <laughs> and the same thing happens with, you know, police homicide. The same thing happens to homicide, period. The same yeah. thing happens. With, there's so many different areas we could talk about, but yeah. you're supposed to present them as equal and and whatnot and leave it at that because yeah. you notice they never gave any statistics no. around it no even in lynching even though they talked about uh, ida b wells in her writing about uh about lynching they never said that it was mostly men right. right they show one i think they show one photo of a woman being lynched and that was it the rest were men the rest were men and that and that's because it, you know that's when you really actually look at the numbers about you know as far as that they they there were some white men and i think they even mentioned that at a certain mm-hmm. point um but you know at the end of the day um i find that kind of reporting suspect because the agenda is 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 much more about foregrounding women and and if you have to foreground women by kind of smudging you know over some accuracy and not really getting into the, any of the data then that's acceptable and and it might have been acceptable in a time period where there was greater trust between black men and women, and you didn't have a whole movement around, you know, downplaying men and targeting them as the problem. And this is a show I did a while back where I was looking at Curry's work where he was pointing out the specific racist white scholarship that feminists were referencing mm-hmm. to frame their ideas around black men. He cited them. He cited the feminists. He cited the racist white scholarships down to the page number and ISBN number of the text. Right. And, you know, people just are oblivious to that. But that's not that's not what black men were doing as far as black women is, are concerned. That's, that's not been the history. That was something that feminists engaged in. And now we're at a place where there needs to be a certain degree of accuracy. There needs to be a, a certain degree of of, of citation that points us to what you're referring to. And this film doesn't do that. It's called academic rigor, as they say, as you would say, right? Yeah. And this film didn't do it. It was actually more, it's more like an advertising piece. You know how um, they use a pretty woman to sell products? Mm-hmm. I think they call it transference, if I'm not mistaken, where you, we transfer the, uh, the desire of that pretty woman it, to their car, to their product, mm-hmm. right? Right. They're using black male suffering and black male uh, heroism, right? Okay. To transfer to these so-called heroines, you know, I'm not taking any, anything away from them, like uh, Ida B. Wells or Phyllis Wheatley, okay? Mm-hmm. But the whole movement is being transferred and framed as something that Black women were at the forefront and actually caused, actually uh, um, projected forward. Mm-hmm. They're transferring what we, what Black men did and their suffering and their sacrifice to these women, just like right. in an advertisement. Right. Right. Except, except we're the pretty girl in there, the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our, our numbers are only relevant when they serve 
yes. a large you know, the argument that they're trying to put forth. So black people are conveniently that's an umbrella term mm -hmm. that allows them to use black male numbers, whether it pertains to death or arrests or yeah. whatever the subject yeah. may be. Uh, may even be, you know, education, literacy issues, uh, who gets put into special ed, whatever those issues are, whatever the discussion is in, black male numbers are useful under the umbrella of black people. Mm -hmm. But we're starting to see in this last few decades, this major shift and trend into deeply foregrounding women and mm -hmm. making absent mm -hmm. black boys and men. And so now in response to that, you have a population of men who've taken it upon themselves to start foregrounding what's not been discussed mm -hmm. in mainstream circles. And those, in the, you know, and those men are not coming out of the academy. They're not coming out of corporate America. They're grassroots. You know, some of it is going to be offensive. Some of it is going to be well articulated. Some of it is going to be all over the place. Some of it is going to be directly targeted, but all of it is going to be dismissed as misogynist. Mm hmm. Because it doesn't foreground women, even though we're seeing that in the mainstream, and that's somehow not enough. So you tell me. If it doesn't center black women, then it doesn't exist, right? There it is. Or it's hatred of black women if it doesn't center black women. As long as we're not kissing their uh, their, their their right round behinds, then it's wrong. Right. So, um, but you know, meanwhile, if you're following the data, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just did my last show looking at suicide. Mm -hmm. I have a section in my book directed toward it. If you're paying attention to these things, what I call, uh, you know, uh, black andro mortality issues, right? Related to the deaths of black men. If you're paying attention to these issues on a regular basis, black men find themselves in the worst parts of, uh, you know, a series of issues that we all seem to deem important. But we don't even know, we don't tend to know ourselves that we're in the worst part of them across the board. And for those that know, we've kind of accepted as a norm. Yeah. But that's not what's really discussed because that's treated as sexist. So, you know, there it is. But uh, anyway, I appreciate you coming through, man. All right, and, Doc. Uh, and and I, well, maybe, maybe we should uh, uh, do it a, a, a film review on Patreon. Um, with this particular, uh, with this particular uh, uh, documentary, because without showing the the images and what we're talking about, is kind of you know we're, we're talking yeah. over it. Yeah, we don't get the impact. Yeah. Whereas the impact would be better served as a critique on the uh, documentary sure. itself, because there's a lot of thousands, thousands of images that you put into this yes. into this film. Yeah, that we, that we we can't we can't adequately actually uh, transfer that or translate that without showing you the images. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's difficult to do that. And you'll, and if you haven't seen it, when you watch it, you'll understand what we mean. Cause it's such a random, I mean, random may be too strong a term, but it, it's, it's, it's kind of a random collage of images and ideas that are sometimes chronological and then sometimes not. And then other times, you know, what I call bio chronological where, or bi chronological where they're comparing two different time periods and contrasting them and, Mm -hmm. Trying to give you the idea that you know the the impulse from the past is primarily fueling certain segments of the community today, but not others. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that there's that there's all of that, and it's so jumbled that to give a review of it without you know walking a population of people through the film directly, it's hard. It it's, is it's hard. Kind of hard. Yeah. Um, you know. So yeah. So that said, um, I do appreciate everybody come coming through. Um, definitely shout out to uh, uh, BGS appreciation to him for being willing to not only watch it, mm -hmm. but talk about it. Yeah. And also, man, before you go, did you get all your super chats? Did you acknowledge all your super chats? Let me see. It's uh, been kind of a light day, but we will acknowledge those who have come through. Um, let me see. Wait a minute. Uh, Okay, so we got a uh, shout out to, to Quentin for the cash app. Shout out to Mr. Donnie Mack. He says, I remember seeing the trailer on Netflix. How does it compare to Ava DuVernay's 13th, which was also a Netflix uh, a few years back? Yeah, I, I, I think 13th was, it was far better. At least far it, better. It, yeah. it had much more accuracy and it wasn't quite as tied to this kind of gynefocal focus. It, I, I see what you're saying though, Donnie. It was there. But it's it was never this pronounced. 
Yeah. You know? So Kendi just, you know, pushed it over the edge as feminists tend to do. Um, Craig Spencer says, uh, Dr. T, greetings from Jamaica. Big up yourself, sir. BGS, it's me, the Castlevania kid. It's the <laughs> okay. dude, believe me now. <laughs> Shout out to Craig. Appreciate that. You know, um, I think he was requesting you review the, the series on Netflix. I don't know Castlevania. if you meant the game or the series. I, I didn't know which one, you know. Yeah. And, and I don't know. I don't. I think it means the series. Okay. I saw the series. Uh, although there's a new chapter to it and maybe he's referring to that and okay. I haven't watched that yet, but uh, anyway, um, so shout out to Craig for that. Shout out to doc H says, uh, thanks for the work. I appreciate that, man. Thanks for the support. Uh, shout out to Vince, uh, who just, uh, who's been a member and support your scholars, support your interests. Appreciate that. Uh, shout out to Joe Herb. Um, thanks for the knowledge. And I think I read the rest. No. Yeah, I did. I did. But this one I want to repost because I wanted you to see it from Distinguished Legacy. It says they did the same thing on Amazon Prime. Silver Dollar totally mm-hmm. erased the men who died preserving their family's legacy. Wow. I haven't okay. seen that. I haven't seen that either. Yeah. I haven't seen oh, that. We'll look for it. Yeah. So shout out to those of you who donated. Please make sure you to continue to do so. Oh, um, hold on. Got a couple more. Uh, shout out to Indigo Flow for that. Um, and then shout out to poor man's passport guy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't take y'all nowhere, man. <laughs> poor man's passport, passport guy. <laughs> Appreciate the support. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> oh, man. What a way in the what a way to end the show. Anyway, uh, but I appreciate all y'all coming through. Support the show, and I want to hear your thoughts. If you've seen the show, I want to hear uh, seen the, uh, the documentary. Put your comments in the comment section, and and give us your thoughts about what you saw. Because we obviously, you know, we didn't cover every yeah. by any means every nook and cranny at all. So, and, and if you want me and Doc to to uh, to do a, a review of the show, you know, reaction to the to the actual documentary on Patreon, please let us know in the uh, comment section. You know, yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. All right. Let me go ahead and pull pull you down, man. Thanks a lot, bro. All right, Doc. All right, man. All right, y'all. Thank you for coming through. Hope you guys have a good night, and I will holler at y'all soon. Peace. <laughs>